Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Doug Wilson, who will be giving a presentation on historical archaeology in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Wilson received his PhD from the University of Arizona in 1991. Uh, and he serves as historical archaeologist in the partnerships program for the Pacific West region of the National Park Service. Uh, Dr. Wilson brings professional experience in National Park Service projects and programs, including uh, the identification, documentation, and evaluation of properties associated with history and cultural heritage. Uh, since 2004, uh, he's also served as the adjunct associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at Portland State University, uh, teaching classes and working with students, volunteers, and stakeholders uh, to conduct historical archaeology in the Pacific Northwest, including the exploration of Western uh, colon uh, uh, colonialism uh, and public and community archaeology. Okay, with that, I'll turn it over to Doug Wilson. Thank you. What a nice introduction. It's so nice to see some of my friends out in the audience and on the screen. Uh, I, I highly encourage you, if you're not, uh, I haven't thought about going to the Northwest meetings, that you go. There's going to be some great sessions. Uh, Cheryl Mack, who I saw on screen, is going to be presenting in my session. There's going to be some really uh, and uh, you get to see a lot of different archaeologists. So be there or be square. Good. And then there's a little trick here where you can hide the, oops, no, that's not it. Hide floating meeting controls. Look at that. Okay. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about the historical archaeology of the Pacific Northwest. Um, but, oops, got to click here. There we go. So, you got a little introduction already, but a little bit more about me. This is how most people see me when I'm out in the field. And I have to, and I'm in my National Park Service uniform. And there are two types of archaeologists there are those who keep immaculately clean in the field. And then there's people like me. And I'm always touching my face and getting in the dirt and, getting it wherever it's dirtiest I get into. And there's a, just a certain type of archaeologist that's like that. Unfortunately, I'm one of those. And this is one of my favorite, favorite pictures. This is where I'm in my happy place out at Fort Vancouver in, in this case. And then a few years ago, you know, I just started to grow beards during the, the, um, my holidays. This was 2019. We went to China. I got to see the 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 uh, the the whole temple with the soldiers and Jian. And uh, after a while, I just stopped shaving after the the vacation. And so now I've got a beard. But this last image of me, my I have two graduate students right now. Um, they were really interested in seeing what I looked like when I was their age, and it's kind of shocking. There I am in Marin County in the 1980s, probably 85 or 86, and I was with the Garbage Project then, and I was studying household hazardous waste using archaeological techniques to learn about a modern problem. And, you know, I really loved that Garbage Project. I thought it was this fabulous ability to use archaeology to reach out and connect with people. And it was shortly after this, I got my PhD and I came to the, the Portland metro area. My, my girlfriend had a job at Evergreen Airlines. I lived in McMinnville for a while. And my first presentation to the Oregon Archaeological so Society was about the garbage project. And I wasn't much older than this. So I've been around a long time. I've, I've been uh, giving talks to y'all for a long, long time. <clears throat> 
Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about the Pacific Northwest, the historical archaeology of the Pacific Northwest. So the region is really immense when you think about it. British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, for the three st states that are on the ocean, on the Pacific Ocean, if you took that coastline, it is as long as the coastline from the tip of Florida to Maine. It's really a huge area. So we're really talking about the historical archaeology of a gigantic place. But the population densities are quite a bit lower than the East Coast. Uh, the, you know, there's population really concentrated in just a few cities. It's an, an area of immense diversity, as we all know, from, you know, the the moist coastlines with the rainforests uh, to the inland valleys, the Willamette Valley, the places with great agriculture, that, that mountain range, the Cascades and the Cordilleran in Canada that basically uh, break the area north-south into two. And then the more arid areas to the east, the plateaus, and of course the Rocky Mountains on the far east side. This is really a gigantic place. And the question is, why would anybody consider this a region that's worthy of, of keeping together? And people have debated that over time. I mean, one, you've got an international boundary. Some people only do work in Canada. Some only do it in the United States. Some people are focused on the coast. A lot of you know pre-contact archaeologists either do coastal or they do plateau. But in reality, the people of this region probably since time immemorial, have been crossing back and forth across those, those mountain areas. And they've been bringing the resources of the east to the west and from the west to the east. And it's the rivers that cross, the mighty Columbia River, the Fraser River in the north, and some of the other rivers that, that create that highway, that corridor that brings people back and forth. So in spite of the people that want to chunk off, you know, eastern Oregon and eastern Washington and join up with Idaho, really we're all connected and we need to work together because we're dependent on one another. And that was true in ancient times and that's true today as well. It's also a place of incredible indigenous diversity. Uh, we see it all around us. Sometimes we it's present and we don't recognize it. We have great sites like the Cathlopotal Plank House or Middle Village Station Camp out at the mouth of the Columbia Chinook Summer Village uh, that I had the, the pleasure to work at. And even the landscapes have this indigeneity to them. This is small camas growing in the fields south of Fort Vancouver with Fort Vancouver in the background. And of course, Native art is all around us. Modern Native artists, are, are their work is found in public buildings and, and for sale everywhere. The tribes are powerful, they're present, and they're still around. And if you hadn't already done this, I would have presented this to you, but you get the idea. There is a indigenous heritage that's really important to the Pacific Northwest. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about tonight, I'm going to kind of give you some definitions about what is historical archaeology. Most of you kind of know what historical archaeology is. I looked at, you know, your your presentations you've had and you're going to have over the year, and you've you've had at least one other historical archaeology presentation. Scott Williams talked about the beeswax wreck, but we're gonna we're gonna go into a little bit more depth and really talk about. What is historical archaeology and why is it important? And, and what is special about historical archaeology in our region, in the Pacific Northwest? And then I'm going to give you a little time tour of historical archaeology. This is based on a book I've written that's going to be published by University of Florida Press. It's, going to, it's actually in production now. It'll probably be out at the end of this year. The digital version might be uh, be coming out earlier, but it's it's named the historical archaeology of the Pacific Northwest, and so we're just going to hit a few snippets, uh, a few sites along that that uh, journey of historical archaeology to kind of get you a, a feel for it in the in the region, and then I'm, I'll conclude with a couple of uh, thoughts about um, it in our region. So, what is historical archaeology? 
This is from the Neatart Sand Spit site, uh, our own um, 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 Newman uh, excavated, uh, Portland State University archaeologist for his PhD dissertation, studied 35 TI1, and it was a, a Tillamook Plank House village, and it had these weird Chinese ceramics in it, and this was kind of the first documented findings of these ceramics that led to what Scott talked about, the beeswax wreck. So we're going to start really fundamentally. What are artifacts? So Barbara Little wrote a book about historical archaeology, talked about ruins, other human-made remains, artifacts are the primary subject matter of archaeology. Material culture is our scientific term for, for archaeology. Um, Barbara Little said, material culture is the physical manifestations of what people do, think, and feel. That sounds pretty good. I'll go with that. But we have to realize that artifact is kind of an antique and ambiguous term. So it really originated out of museum work, believe it or not. The earliest archaeologists kind of sat in museums, people had brought in a bunch of stuff from around there, and they tried to classify it into meaningful categories, space, time, systematics. Um, and they were trying to figure out what happened in the past, how old things are, and this really happened in Europe, tied to nationalism. Think about the Germans or the Danes, Norwegians, the, the English were coming up with these systems of, you know, Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and talking about their great sites and how their people related to that were really important and the other guys weren't that great. And of course, in the United States, it was really tied to kind of an understanding of these translated in, into a colonial situation. Okay, here's an artifact. This is the artifact that every archaeologist would love to find, the gold death mask of Agamemnon, dug up by Heinrich Schliemann at Mycenae. You all know that Heinrich Schliemann also excavated at Troy, I'm sure. Troy, uh, he was actually so enthusiastic about getting to the Hellenic version of Troy that he plowed right through it and went to the, the next layer down and kind of screwed it up. But that's an artifact. Ivor Noel Hume, historical archaeologist, he wrote in the Guide to Artifacts of Colonial America, he used an incredibly easy definition. He used the Oxford English de Dictionary definition. He was English, an artificial product. How succinct, how reasonable. It's everything that's not a natural product. It's any, everything that's artificial, created by humans. So the questions are, how are humans linked with and related to their artifacts? And what are the social dimensions of material culture? Consider buttons. A typical thing found at historical archaeological sites, buttons. They're small, they're cool looking, they're often intact. We can think about them in terms of how they function. What are their functional attributes? And so a button is like in the old days, they had pins to put clothing together. They invented buttons and suddenly you could clasp your clothing together easily. This is a tomback coat button found inside Fort Vancouver that would have clasped a coat together for a gentleman at, at the, of, a fur, of the fur trade. And of course that would have kept him warm and dry in our wet, cold winters and even marches. Um, and of course, it has a, a, an important function. But of course, buttons are also part of clothing and clothing is style and style has to do with how we portray ourselves. And so this button also represents what an English gentleman out in the Pacific Northwest would have worn to create a status that was different from the working class. So there are social attributes. Now here's another button. This came from Fort Hoskins. It's a little blurry. Sorry about that. But it's uh, got a big A in the eagle. So it's a military button. 
And the A stands for artillery. If you were an artillery officer, you would have this button for your coat. However, if you know anything about Fort Hoskins, there was never an artillery unit at Fort Hoskins. So this is a non-regulation button. Now, it turns out that most of these kind of non-regulation buttons and other sorts of, of things that you find at, at Fort Hoskins are found in the commanding officer's quarters. And the thought is from Jason Eichelberger is that the commanding officers had more leeway. They were in charge. Their you know, commanding officers were a long way away at Fort Vancouver, and they could kind of do whatever they wanted. They could, you know, they could wear a non-regulation button if they wanted to. They could have an heirloom from or, or something that was kept from another uh, iteration of their lives or had been given to them. And so a button might represent a status that is different from the status of your officers below you. And then here are some simple Prosser buttons. Look at your shirt. I got one right there, I think. So these are our pressed China buttons. These were found at my friend uh, Eric Gleason and Jackie Chung's building in the Dalles part of the old China, Chinatown of the Dalles. And these were found behind the building. They're the, the building functioned as a retail store. So they could have been on, on button cards. It was also a laundry. So it could be associated with that laundry function. But these buttons, according to, to Jamie French, also might have had another function. They could have been used for gambling. And at the time in the Dalles and elsewhere in the Pacific Northwest and, and on the West Coast, Chinese Americans were discriminated against. There was the Chinese Exclusion Act, which prevented most Chinese Americans from immigrating into the United States. And for most of them, they could not become United States citizens. So these buttons could have reflect the gambling tokens uh, a kind of a gambling resistance to what white America was doing to uh, Chinese Americans in, in in a form of resistance of, of of maintaining a traditional culture that was different and kind of stuck your thumb in the nose of the local authorities. If the place got raided, they'd see a bunch of buttons here. There's nothing going on here. It's a it's a laundry, right? So. Artifacts have meanings, they have functions, they have emotions tied to them, they reflect the people and what the people wanted to show, and they reflected subversive practices. Now today, moving in beyond that, we have the concept of belongings. So Shape et al. have used the terms belongings, and there's other folks uh, that are using belongings or heirlooms as an alternative to our good old archaeological artifacts or objects. And the notion is that other people have imbued different meanings to their things. The indigenous Coast Salish worldview places people and belongings in the same space, and that their things, their belongings, actually convey ancestral knowledge back to people living today. And so I love that term. I love the notion that we imbue our things with special meaning and that special meaning speaks to us from the past. And so I'll, I'll use that interchangeably with artifacts. This is a, a great kind of example of changing meanings tied to very quotidian artifacts. These are wine bottles that have been reformulated. Their meaning has changed and they become part of Gaudi's Palau Guel in Barcelona. And they are now these simple wine bottles are suddenly an art piece. Uh, and if you've ever been to Barcelona, I'd highly recommend you go see some of, of Gaudi's artwork. There's houses, house museums, there's this amazing cathedral. Etc. And he often reused basic things, trash, if you will, into his his uh, works. Okay, so that's enough enough about artifacts, enough about belongings. So, what is historical archaeology? Historical archaeology studies the material culture, artifacts, belongings, 
documentary records, oral history of people of the historic period, which in North America dates to the first colonial, largely European explorations of the area, which means around here, it's maybe as old as 300 years ago, more likely right around 200 years ago uh, to the present, and in the East Coast, maybe 500 years ago. But his historical period, even a reasonable thing to talk about. This is an image from a hops camp, turn of the century in the Puget Sound area. And these are all indigenous people that are at that hops camp. And they're working, picking hops, but they're also revisiting some of their ancestral territory that maybe they're only allowed to go to because they're doing this capitalist activity. But at the, at the same time, they're doing dances, they're socializing, they're reconstituting who they are. And I, I think a lot of indigenous people kind of have a problem with us calling it historical versus prehistoric archaeology, because to them, it's all history from time immemorial to the present. And so we've got this kind of arbitrary boundary from when the white folks came in, we call it historical archaeology, and often we focus on the archaeology of white folks. And before that, it's all indigenous people, but when the white folks came, the indigenous people kind of went away. And as we know, that's that's not the case. We have very uh, lively, engaged tribes today. So what can historical archaeology do? It contrasts that material evidence, evidence with historical accounts and oral histories. And we can support past narratives, the old stories, and, and tell if they're true or not. We can expose biases and, and delve into places where the historical record is silent, often tied to maybe controversial issues where people just don't want to talk about it because it's so controversial, or to the lives of those who are poorly documented, those who didn't write their own histories. We can explore the meanings of material culture to contemporary people in examining how some groups persisted through time. And we can examine the unique role of material things in the preservation and interpretation of past and present events and identities. Okay. Enough of that background. You get the idea where I'm going, uh, coming from. We're going to take our tour through time. We're going to have five stops. We're going to start with that early explorers and fur traders period. We're going to talk about the later fur traders, the Oregon Trail settlers. We're going to jump into the 20th century and talk a little bit about World War II and then the archaeology of modernity. Bring us back to that garbage project picture I started with. Okay, early fur trade, earliest uh, you know people on the on the the that came to the Pacific Northwest from Europe. There's Captain Cook uh, coming there, uh, landing at Nootka Sound, finding all this fabulous animal pelts that you could trade in Asia, and brings on kind of the gold rush. The, the technically the Russians were here a little bit before the Mexican, the Spanish were coming up from California, but most people cite Captain Cook as kind of the, the, the start of the rush of the, the fur trade. Uh, on the terrestrial side, the Northwest Company comes Alexander McKenzie, comes exploring from the Peace River area down uh, to Dean Channel right about there. Can you see my cursor? Yeah. Uh, Dean Channel, oops, I lost it there, uh, marks it, heads back, and that starts the terrestrial fur trade rush. And of course, we've got our old American Lewis and Clark folks came about a little, you know, close to 15 years later through the Snake River area down to um, the mouth of the Columbia River. So, just going to talk about a couple of sites from this early fur trade uh, period. They're both in British Columbia. Uh, Yukot really uh, represents that early maritime fur trade. 
Um, this was some of the earliest historical archaeology in British Columbia. They were looking for the Spanish fort that was set up there, and there was the whole dispute with the the, Eng the British, and they they had uh, you know Vancouver negotiated with Quadra and decided, well, you British can have this area. Uh, wasn't quite that simple, but um, and the archaeology was looking for the fort, and they found it. And they were looking for traces of that earliest colonial period. And they dug a big trench in the middle of that, that big mound in front of those buildings. And that was the midden. That was the trash pile. And they didn't find a lot of artifacts from that early colonial period. But they did find a lot of artifacts from the indigenous people that lived there. And it really wasn't until about the 1870s layers that European American uh, and Canadian uh, goods are really beginning to flood in after this becomes a Canadian uh, province instead of a colony. And so the effects of the colonial period on the Yukon was really pretty minor. They kind of kept on doing their thing after, you know, the settlement with the, the Europeans, the area was kind of abandoned and they just, lived a good life till the became a province. We contrast that with the Upper Peace River. This is on kind of the, the central northern part of British Columbia. There's a couple of forts up there that have been studied. Uh, importantly, um, all, both were tied to uh, uh, lakes, uh, de developing dams for hydroelectric power. Uh, Rocky Mountain Fort was the earlier one, uh, starting in the 1790s. Fort St. John's is the later iteration uh, around uh, 1823 uh, is where this image is made. And these early forts are all kind of the, the same. They're kind of dinky. If you go to Fort Vancouver, that's a big fort. These are dinky forts. There's usually kind of a, a central house for the, the clerk, the gentleman that was in charge of the post, maybe a trading room. Uh, there's a men's hall, and then there's a storehouse, and that's about it. The Rocky Mountain Fort didn't even have a palisade around it because they had such good relations with the Doneza, the, the beaver Indians that were living there. By the time Fort St. John's is, is going around 1823, the HBC called it uh, Fort Le Epinette. Um, things were beginning to change, though, for the Doneza people. They had been, had been given access to fur trade goods. They really liked all the stuff they could purchase at these forts, and they were hunting bison and beaver to extinction. And so there was a massive decline in the environment for the Deneza people. It had important impacts on their culture. And the Hudson's Bay Company takes over from the Northwest Company in 1821. And in 1823, the Deneza kill the people at this fort. It's called the Fort St. John's Massacre. And it's probably related to this ecological disaster that was created by the fur trade. So we've got Yukot, the fur traders came, no big deal. And we've got the area of the Peace River and, oh, big deal. And the Hudson's Bay Company left. They left for decades before they finally came back and started trading again. Okay, that's all we can say about that early fur trade. On to the Hudson's Bay Company posts. The Hudson's Bay Company, as I said, came in. They took over from the Northwest Company, 1821. Their headquarters of this enormous Columbia department was Fort Vancouver, one of my favorite places in all the world. Uh, one of the things that the Hudson's Bay Company did that was different is that they um, looked at, uh, at diversifying their economy. So most of the, the sites were this small, relatively dinky, fur trade posts that were focused on gathering animal pelts, beaver, uh, those sorts of things uh, to, to make money. But the Hudson's Bay Company started developing much bigger forts uh, and linking them all together much uh, more intensively. And at places like Fort Colville, they, they reestablished their fort uh, 
on the the massive salmon fishery of, of Kettle Falls, and they they started fishing and, and gathering fish and also doing massive amounts of agriculture. Likewise, Fort Langley was established on the Fraser River because of the salmon potential and because there was lots of agricultural lands around it. Fort Victoria, which became the headquarters after this became U.S. territory, uh, and that also was tied to agricultural pursuits and other sorts of pursuits. And then, of course, Fort Nisqually, which was started out as a fur trade post, but immediately was set up there for the agriculture, and eventually the Puget Sound Agricultural Company was situated there. So these were bigger forts, and they reflected this more diversified uh, activities of the Hudson's Bay Company. This is Fort Vancouver. You can see the earliest iteration of the 1829 fort. There's one fort that was uh, uh, earlier uh, that was about a, a few miles uh, to the east, but this was the, the first iteration of the 1829 fort. And you can see it had uh, big fur trade warehouses. It had uh, warehouses for trade goods and a chief factor's house and some other sorts of subsidiary things, typical of a earlier fur trade post, kind of a little bit bigger because this was the headquarters. But by 1845, it's a massive thing. You've got specialized buildings for grain storage, for beef storage. Uh, you've got, you know, a big chief factor's house, uh, uh, Indian trade store function over here, et cetera. And the area around the fort, cultivated fields, pastures, a giant garden, and this major village off to the west, uh, which was, um, you know, perhaps the largest colonial settlement in the Pacific Northwest between Sitka, Alaska, and Yerba Buena, a.k.a. San Francisco, California. Now, I've spoken to you in the past about Fort Vancouver, so I'm not going to dwell too much, but I'm going to point out one archaeological dig that was done a number of years ago, and it's right down here at the pond area. And there's this little fenced area here next to the pond. So we've been talking about how the fur trade impacted the indigenous people. One thing that impacted the indigenous people tied to the historic period was disease. In the 1820s, late 1820s and 1830s, early 1830s, epidemics really swept the area. They were recorded at Fort Vancouver as the fever and ague, or intermittent fever, which we believe was malaria. And while um, in the worst time was in kind of the first few years of the 1830s, most of the people inside the fort got sick. They did have some medicines. They had quinine. They, they tried a few other sorts of things. They also had some crazy ideas about medicine back then. They were using, uh, you know, bleeding people, and they were putting on the cups to drive out the ill humors. Um, but very few of the, the, the colonial people died. But upwards of 90% of the population of the indigenous people of the lower Columbia are thought to have been killed as part of this uh, and earlier epidemics. So we just had that pandemic that came through here. It was pretty bad. It, you know, messed us all up. Uh, but imagine nine out of every 10 people being dead on the lower Columbia. That's, that's a, a Holocaust, if you will. So I pointed out this place, the hospital, which is the archaeological remnants tied to that time period. As part of State Route 14 work and, and its connection to I-5, they found the hospital. It was a palisaded, it's like a little fort, a palisaded area. And they believe that that's where they put sick people from the fort and they treated them. And so they found medicine bottles, drugs, they found um, cupping cups, uh, they found uh, other sorts of things. They found a lot of kits that had clothing fragments, buttons in them that may have represented burning clothes 
tied to sick people or perhaps tied to people who had passed away. And then they had these interesting little things called smudge pits. Now, this is a smudge pit from the village. This was probably used for treating hides. They'd put a framework around it. They'd make a real smoky fire, and they would treat hides, probably deer hides, for making moccasins. And this is typical of the fur trade, east coast all the way to the west coast at fur trade sites and some indigenous sites, but not on the Pacific Northwest. You'll see these. But inside the hospital, the thought was that they were generating these smudge pits to generate smoke, to cleanse the air of the malaria, the bad air, and help to drive it away. Now, if you had malaria and you were in a really smoky area, it probably wouldn't help you. It'd be the other things like the quinine that would 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 take care of you. But But that's the archaeological trace of the epidemics. Now, we know that indigenous people were coming to Fort Vancouver to try to get treated, try to get medicine, but there wasn't enough medicine. And we know that many of the indigenous people that came died, um, and they, they came because someone would take care of their bodies. Okay, that was kind of a downer. Sorry about that. But archaeology helps to illuminate that part of the story. Okay, let's talk about the Oregon Trail and the settlers. Here's our Oregon Trail coming from Independence to Vancouver and Oregon City and maybe even elsewhere. And really iconic of that Oregon Trail experience is the March of the Mounted Riflemen. There were five companies of, of cavalry, 700 horses, 1,200 mules, 171 wagons crossing on the Oregon Trail. And um, William Wing Loring was the, the uh, lieutenant colonel in charge of this group. And he writes about how dusty it is and dry. And you can only imagine how much dust was being generated by all these troops, these horses and mules and 171 wagons. It's like the biggest wagon train that had ever been across the, uh, the, the Oregon Trail. And they were coming out to protect the Oregon Trail uh, settlers, and they established the military uh, Fort Vancouver, Vancouver Barracks, um, and also lived for a time in Oregon City and set up other sorts of uh, forts along the route. Major Osborne Cross, who was the quartermaster uh, for the company, wrote a book about the mounted uh, riflemen, and he, he wrote when they got to the Willamette Valley. He wrote the land from the base of the Cascade Mountains to the junction of the two rivers will bear comparison with any in the states. Grain is raised in this country in great abundance, consisting of oats, barley, and wheat. Vegetables of the finest kind grow without the least trouble. So in 1849, he's writing about how agriculturally amazing the Willamette Valley and the valleys on the west side of the Cascades are. And so right here, you've got the, 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 two, the two parts of the Oregon Trail equation. It's dry and dusty. Uh, they wrote about you know the, the fierce tribes that were out there. It was dangerous because of the people that were there. But you get here, and there's this agricultural payoff that you can make uh, – become wealthy and make a good living. These are the folks at Shampooey, where you had fur traders turned farmers with settlers who were farmers and deciding to create a provisional government. And I don't see any indigenous people there. Maybe they're out in the, the bushes watching and saying, this is probably not good for us. Oregon Trail archaeology, you all know the ruts are some distinctive things that have been measured and mapped. Here's our own examples from up on uh, the Barlow Road, up on Mount Hood, the divot that represents uh, the old wagon tracks and important historical places like the Laurel Hill Chute, where they had to lower down the wagons to get to uh, the Oregon City and the Willamette Valley. Related to the, the Oregon Trail, 
is this conception. And it's in all of our brains because those of us who went to school and learned about the Oregon Trail, or those of us who were young enough to play the Oregon Trail game uh, in the 1980s, know that it's all about surviving the trail, making it to trail's end. And this image, American Promise, represents kind of the, the vision of um, um, Turner, Frederick Jackson Turner, who came up with this thesis about how America became great. It was because of having all this land that could be, you could push out the indigenous people and you could have a great wealth of areas for people to expand an economic release valve is what he termed it fueled individualism democracy and nationalism so it was a crucial element of um westward expansion and the in the creation of the united states and here it is embodied as a caucasian blonde in a flowing white dress crossing there, scaring away the Indians, scaring away the bison and the wild animals. And then came the flood of the fur traders, the, the, the settlers, the early settlers, the miners, the farmers, eventually the railroads and the ports. Progress. And here, of course, is our modern day version, just to say that that mythos, that idea is still with us in our popular culture. Here's the American promise, Yellowstone style. We got the Caucasian blonde. She's wearing the white dress. And we know that something bad happened in that wagon because it's on fire. And uh, I, I love Yellowstone and its spinoffs. But uh, this, is, this is part of that Ternarian thesis. This is part of our origin myth. So let's talk about the archaeology of settlement. William Earl was a guy who came out in 1845 with his mother and his brother. In 1846, they settled south of the Santiam River. This is the one feature. It was in a, The site was in a plow zone. This is the one feature uh, that shows one of the foundation uh, pillars of the house uh, that William Earl built. And William Earl, they, they came out, you know, got ahead of myself, they came out, they had virtually nothing. They didn't have any seeds. They didn't have a plow. They made a plow out of a tree stump and a metal bar that they put together and they plowed 20 acres, but they didn't have seed. So the brothers had to work at or at the shampooy to get enough seed to go and put in 20 acres of wheat. It sounded pretty grim. And, and, at the same time, this is the area of the Saniam Trail. There's the Saniam Band of the Kalapuya. They're coming through. And these guys are from, you know, the Midwest. They're not going to take any, you know, indigenous people. They've crossed all this danger. They pushed them out. They basically, the, the brother wrote in his journal, we drove them out of the country and they never came back. So that's our vision of kind of the early settlers but William Earl and his family diversified very rapidly, much more rapidly than Turner would have predicted. And with the gold rush, they ran down to the gold fields. They did a little bit of mining, but then they got the idea, oh, we can sell them stuff. We've got beef cows. We've got wheat. We can go down there and sell supplies and make a fortune. He created a trading post and stock ranch in the Applegate region for the mines down there. Locally, he, he built a sawmill with a partner. And by 1852, he owned 606 acres and raised wheat, horses, cattle, and pigs. He was the top 4% of wealth earners, according to the 1854 tax assessment for Saniam County. In 1851, he took a trip down to the gold fields. And when he came back, it's reported that his children played with $50 slugs of gold. So this is not our vision of the easy Ternarian, you know, thesis of you get the settlers, the settlers struggle for, you know, decades before they clear the land. And then the other guys come in and start working. No, William Earl's working it right away. And you look at his 
artifacts, the belongings from his house. And there's this, you know, this is an early farm. You think they're going to be pumping all the profits back into making the farm bigger, but that's not the case. He's spending a ton of money on fancy ceramics, including some of the spode ceramics that we find at Fort Vancouver. At the assemblage, there were 21 distinctive types of table plate patterns. There are 20 teaware patterns. It's a represent. There were special sauce bottles, all kinds of things that represented a very wealthy farmer uh, that had made it big in the Willamette Valley. Okay, and so in that case, William Earl drove out the indigenous people, and he made a fortune. The other side of the story of the settlement is tied to hops. Hops grow or grew really well in the Willamette Valley. It was an exceptional environment once they figured it out. Hops obviously are used for making beer and ale. Farmers in the Willamette Valley could achieve returns up to six times greater than Europe or New York State. And so here was a crop that they could just make a fortune on. And many people did. The archaeology of hops uh, farms are these tied to these distinctive barns. These were the areas where they would dry the hops. They have these uh, multiple chimneys. They would have to keep it warm. It was a big fire hazard. And uh, also, I'll mention the large groups of people that had to pick the hops. It's grown in valleys from British Columbia to the Willamette Valley. The first commercial hops in the Puyallup Valley in Washington was a guy named Jacob Meeker, who is an Oregon Trail immigrant. His son was Ezra Meeker. If you know anything about the Oregon Trail, Ezra Meeker was the number one promoter of the Oregon Trail and went back and forth across it in his ox-driven uh, wagon and set up monuments and relocated Oregon Trail sites. But before that, he was a tireless promoter of hops. And he made a fortune at hops from his father's and his business. This is his little farm, uh, the Ezra Meeker and Company in Poyallup. Look at the, the size of this uh, hops drying barn. This guy's watering down the roof because there's so much uh, fire danger. You want to make sure you don't start a fire and burn up your profits. And uh, really an amazing, amazing place. So I mentioned the labor. They had to get a lot of labor to pick the hops. And so these hops picking camps were a big deal. Up in British Columbia, they were close to indigenous villages, and indigenous people were some of the labor used to pick hops. We saw the picture from the Puget Sound area of indigenous people picking hops. In the south, in the Willamette Valley, there were reservations, but you could get, as an indigenous pe person, a pass to go out and work in the hops picking camps. So hop picking became part of an, an annual round of indigenous people as well as uh, other, other people that needed work, including Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, uh, er, immigrants from other parts of the world would come and become part of the hops picking camps. But for the indigenous people, it became one of the few places that they could reconnect with their original indigenous landscape. And in a time when the white populations were saying, you need to go and become educated in white ways, and they were banning the potlatch and winter dances were being banned. This is a place where they could socialize. This is a place where they could reconnect with their landscape. And so the hops picking camps and the archeology span of them is tied very closely to the persistence of the indigenous people and why they're still around today. Okay, enough of Oregon Trail. We're now going to go to World War II and talk about Japanese Americans. The Japanese Americans came after the, the uh, 1882 uh, uh, Chinese uh, immigration law. The Chinese 
labor decreased, but a lot of people still needed labor. And so they started inviting Japanese in to work in logging camps. They did agriculture. They had truck farms. There were quite a few Japanese, particularly in British Columbia and in Washington state, but really throughout the Pacific Northwest. And Japanese Americans were seen either as a yellow menace on the one hand, or as a model minority on the other. The Meiji uh, Japanese emperor was really into westernization and western modernizing of Japan. And so there was a real push from the government for Japanese to become more western. On the other hand, uh, many of the uh, people in the United States and British Columbia were a little leery of the Japanese. They were definitely an other and Paula Johnson studied some Senru poetry, also known as haiku, on a stone in a yard in Seattle area. And then she did a whole paper on this poetry and how it represents the place of the Japanese in between these two worlds. And of course, then World War II happened. In 1942, of course, we were at war with Japan. We went to war with Italy and uh, Germany, but the Japanese were the ones that were targeted with the Executive Order 9066, and about 100,000 Japanese Americans on the West Coast were incarcerated. There were a number of uh, government agencies, the Wartime Civilian Control Agency, uh, incarcerated about 7,500 at the Western Washington State Fairgrounds. Locally, we had about over 4,000 people at the Pacific International Livestock at the Expo Center. And then another agency, the War Relocation Authority, while they're holding people there, were building what they called internment camps. But they were really places to incarcerate Japanese. And one of those is Minandoka in the Idaho Sagebrush Flats. Minandoka, um, Jeff Burton, who's a National Park Service archaeologist, conducted a survey of all these uh, internment camps uh, in his book, Confinement and, and Ethnicity. Uh, at Minandoka, 600 buildings were built in eastern Idaho. And if you've ever been to eastern Idaho, it's not exactly a lovely place to spend the winter. It's hot in the summer. Uh, but they put in 600 buildings, uh, and ultimately the place housed uh, up to 13,000 Japanese Americans. Now I went with Jeff Burton and, and surveyed uh, a portion of Minandoka, and it was really interesting because the Bureau of Reclamation had a sign there, and they interpreted it, and they called it a concentration camp. And after the war, the, the veterans were given property, out there. And so they could take, I don't know, 40 acres or something and each one, and you could get 40 acres or maybe a hundred acres. And then they would pick up a half of a barracks and deliver it to you out in the middle of the, the sagebrush flats. And so there were still at the time we were doing the survey, there were still world war II veterans that were living out there. And I remember the guy coming up in his pickup one day and complaining to us about that Bureau of Reclamation sign saying, you know, the Japanese got to have passes. They went out and worked in the agricultural fields. They worked in town and it was not like concentration camps. I was in Europe. I saw concentration camps. And so his perspective of this place was very different. Now, one of the people on the crew was Anna Tamura. Anna Tamura's grandmother had been incarcerated here, and she had a very different perspective about this particular constant, you know, this uh, incarceration camp, let's call it. So the material remains of this place are the guardhouse and the, the uh, waiting room that still has some of the basalt walls. There's traces of the buildings, et cetera. Anna Tamura became so interested in this aspect of the heritage. She's a landscape architect that she went out and she dogged, she found this a fabulous picture of Kogita's garden at Minandoka, where this Japanese 
American had created this incredibly beautiful Japanese garden amidst an incarceration camp with water features and sculpture and you name it. And she documented another garden that had made, been made by the Japanese Americans uh, at the front entrance, right when you come in, there was a board called the honor roll, which was all of the Japanese Americans, even though they were incarcerated there, they had joined the US military, they created units that went to uh, Europe and were some of the most decorated American units in World War II. And there was a, a garden that was associated with that. And it was in the shape of an eagle. And it represented the patriotism of the Japanese Americans that even in spite being incarcerated, they still love the United States and wanted to show their respect and their connection to the United States. And so these archeological remains represent things that question, that, that provide a contrast between our ideas about what happened in the past and what really happened. It provides nuance. And that's one of the beauties of historical archeology. span Okay, last stop today. I couldn't get away from you without talking a little bit about garbage. It was this great University of Idaho camp, campus trash study. Uh, Stacy Camp, uh, who was at University of Idaho at the time, had a special class in archaeology. They went out and they they looked at all the stuff after a tailgating party before a WSU uh, uh, game. And not surprisingly, they found a lot of bottle caps and aluminum cam tabs and cigarette butts and other sorts of belongings tied to alcohol consumption associated with football. But they also looked at other areas of the campus and they found some real disconnects between what people were supposed to be doing and what they were actually doing, where they were supposed to be throwing garbage and where they were actually throwing garbage. And this represents that continuing idea of we can use archaeology to look at the way we manage our waste and how we can better plan to intervene in changing the nature of the waste stream. Another related aspect of the archaeology of today is what I call activist archaeology. Now, this was study was not done in the Pacific Northwest, but it's highly relevant to people, um, you know, in the region today. We have a tremendous issue with houselessness. And these guys, Zimmerman and Welch, went out and they documented homeless camps to see what can you learn about the homeless from their material things, from their belongings. And one of the things had to do with the good intentions of people versus what actually happens in reality. And so they documented that there were lots of shoes that were left behind and they're wondering, why are the houseless leaving their shoes here? What's that all about? Why is that part of their waste stream? But if you think about it, you're going to a thrift store or you're being given shoes and they may not fit. It's not like going to a shoe store. And so the ones that fit good, uh, you're going to wear out. Ones that aren't, you're just going to leave. Likewise, things like toothpaste and shampoo, conditioner, lotion, deodorant, with all the best intentions, they documented, you know, religious groups and, and civic groups that were giving away packets of stuff based on those people's ideal of what houseless people could do with it. They say, oh, they must be getting awfully dirty out there on the streets. These things will help them to clean up. But if you think about it, where are you going to take a shower when you're living on the streets? Where are you going to use deodorant? What's, what's the purpose? Why are you going to shave? So, uh, and just a kind of a notion of kind of that, that idea of, of what we think we're doing and what we're really doing. Here's an Amazon uh, special 24 kits of hygiene and toiletry kits for men, women, travel, or charity. And lastly, I went to the Society for Historical Archaeology meetings in Oakland, and they had a session. I was in this session 
which was honoring a historical archaeologist who had passed away. And there were lots of people like me, old, that were remembered this guy, that knew him, um, that were talking about him. But I ducked out of that session. I went next door, and there was a session on activist archaeology. And Kate Ellenberger was giving a talk about the material culture of rioting. And they had collected these things that had come from our own Portland riots and determined that there is a material culture associated with how the police were reacting to the rioters, the, the, um, which Kate called police violence. And I have to say that that room was packed. And those archaeologists, they didn't look like me. They were young. And this is really kind of the youth are extremely interested in connecting material culture and understanding how it affects our world today. And so our good work with the Oregon Archaeological Society and with, with other things, the way to attract students is to bring them in with those relevant issues, issues that they find are important to them. Okay. So what's the importance of historical archaeology? Historical archaeology can be used to question some of the old stories, to enlarge some of our old narratives, or to question them, uh, maybe even dispel some of the myths that we've built up over the last hundred years, and maybe sometimes add a little nuance, maybe sit, tell some new stories. It engages... Um, and uncovers items, belongings that can have real meaning to people living today and that represent their identity and their culture, and in some cases represent their survivance, their survival uh, from the colonial period. And I'm talking about minority populations, Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, indigenous populations. We can also use archaeology, historical archaeology, to solve problems of relevance to people living today. And we can look at how we can use this unique technique in our ability to look at documentary records, to look at what people say, and actually really connect into what people are actually doing in the ground. Thank you. We've got some questions here. Could the source change malaria? Was that problem with the date? Did that malaria was carried by sailors coming to Port Vancouver at that time? So, so the question was about uh, malaria. And the interesting thing is that um, the areas around here are fairly swampy, and that fever and ague would come in the summertime. And it's thought that the malaria um, carrying mosquitoes, perhaps they came, you know, via the ships, or maybe the conditions just became perfect. Now, a lot of times in the region around here, we're spraying to keep the, the mosquito populations down. But back then, there was probably a lot more mosquitoes uh, living. So uh, a guy named Bob Boyd wrote a book called The Spirit of, of Pestilence. Uh, and he goes into quite a bit of detail and makes a really compelling case for, for malaria. Other questions? Yeah, were Fulton Sparks focused on being warehouses? How much of it was military? And were there spots that were more military? I saw when you said that one of the forces that was attacked had already built a palisade around it. I'm just wondering how common it was. Uh, you know, in, in the fur trade, not many of them. In most cases, the fur traders were very interested in having good relations with indigenous people. Many times they would, you know, the clerks and some of the men would marry into local tribes to maintain relations so they could continue to get goods. Now, when the Hudson's Bay Company came in, a little bit different. There was some of that 
uh, early on. There was certainly a history of that going on, but also there was a notion of we're going to help the missionaries evangelize the, the indigenous people, and we're actually going to start at least saying that we're going to be teaching indigenous children about how to be good English farmers, basically. So, so it, it began to change a bit, but in many cases, there might be a palisade that was primarily to keep the, the good safe from, from being pilfered. Uh, not so much. Uh, there's a few exceptions out at uh, Fort Walla Walla. They had a very strong fortification because they weren't sure that the local, you know, the, the Walla Walla and the Umatilla were going to be friendly. Nez Perce. So that one was called the the fortress uh, um, out there. But but for the most part, they had good relations. There are some exceptions. Uh, John McLaughlin uh, went out to the coast uh, when there was a, a ship, one of uh, the Hudson's Bay Company ships was wrecked. Um, the local people, uh, it is said uh, on the, the McLaughlin side that they killed some of their people and he went in there and killed a few or many people, depending on which side of the story. There's also another incidence up on Puget Sound, but for most of the time, the relationships were good, uh, but there there were these points of contention. There was this uh, idea of how are we going to assimilate indigenous people? How are we going to give them the skills to be good English or American citizens? You had a question in the way back there, David? Um, they did find bone buttons and metal buttons and shell buttons, but those ones are actually prosser buttons, which is a process of compressing ceramic. And it's still made today. Some people call them China buttons, but they're not really technically China, but it's a it's a compressed ceramic button. Yeah. Settler population, and two was the um, kind of you know was the the demand for it was it all local was the market for it or just was it like railroad hops? Yeah, that's that's great great question. So uh, hops were brought in; they're not indigenous, uh, and they were you know basically European or or East Coast uh, crop, um, and they were the earliest settlers were maybe growing some hops for medicinal reasons, maybe to brew their own beer or ale. But when they started really getting to the hops production, it was to ship. And they would have been, even though there weren't railroads yet, they were shipping them uh, to the East Coast or to Europe where they could get top dollar for them because it was it was such a, a good crop and they could produce so much compared to their competitors uh, back East. Yeah, apparently. And then eventually they got the railroads and that made it even easier. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. At a lot of the hops camps, there was whole families that would come out there. And, you know, in Puget Sound, it became kind of um, a a tourist area. They'd actually build hotels where you could go see the Indian dances associated with the hop picking camps. And it became this big deal. Now there, there weren't as much of that down in the Willamette Valley, but, and we know that there's, you know, Chinese working in the hops fields. Uh, there were, um, um, you know, folks from the Grand Ron reservation or the Celeste reservation that were working in the hops fields. So it's probably a similar sort of, dynamic, but maybe with different types of people and, and maybe more uh, of other types of immigrants. So, yeah. Yeah, basically everywhere within the Pacific Northwest, you can find evidence. So, you know, the Owyhee Mountains out in Eastern Oregon are named Hawaii after Hawaii. Um, there's Kanaka Creeks everywhere. 
Native Hawaiians wound up in the gold fields. Uh, Chelsea Rose, uh, for her master's thesis, documented Kanaka Flats, which was kind of a notorious area next to Jacksonville. A lot of the Native Hawaiian populations from here went up to um, Victoria and became part of the population there. And there's still a Native Hawaiian population that's directly tied to the fur trade. And my my uh, buddy uh, Malia Lane Kamahaley uh, documented those as part of her uh, master's thesis. Uh, she's Native Hawaiian who was adopted by an anthropologist. Go figure. She works for the Park Service too. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Dr. Wilson. That was, um, yeah, that was a great talk. Very interesting. Uh, thanks, everybody here at OMSI for uh, coming out in person. Um, you may have noticed that uh, we're trying to lure people in to uh, uh, socialize more and uh, do more meet and greet type stuff. So um, we're going to start um, having uh, the meeting room open at 630 for the monthly meetings. Um, there's a table of refreshments over there and help yourself on the way out. Uh, but hopefully for those of you um, on Zoom, I um, uh, encourage you to come out and meet some of your fellow OAS members. Okay, everybody have a safe trip home. Good seeing you all.